Well, let's uh, join together in welcoming our Nipawa campus this morning. Always good to have you with us. We're going to start this morning with a challenging verse from Acts 19, 11. And I want you to pay careful attention to your gut reflex to this verse. Okay, here we go. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Paul, working in his shop with canvas or leather, gets sweaty. He takes a handkerchief and he mops his brow. He sets it down. Then at the end of his, his day, he works from dawn till about 11, and then he goes and lectures. We'll see that later. He sets his apron aside, and then people sneak into his workshop. And they take his handkerchief, and they take his apron, and they go to where somebody that they, presumably somebody they love, because that would be where you would go, and they take this garment of Paul's, and they place it near them or on them, or they touch them with it, and they get better. Your reflex reaction to that story. I think there's two, there's probably a whole swath of options, but here's, here's two that I think um, capture where most of us will be with it. Some of us are as if, as if. And then, because we're always thinking in our context, right? We're thinking about where we live, so we're going, um, we got programs for PAC today. I'm gonna kind of give you some information. Now, what would you think about a story if one of those programs it was made its way to the hospital, and it touched somebody that was sick, and because they touched the program, they got better. You're like, okay, now I'm in the as if. Now I'm in the as if. With the story, okay, that's the Bible, but, but now I'm in the as if category. Are you, are you poised with stories like this to, to be a cynic? Or are you, you poised, poised to go, what if? What if? What if a program from this place, what if? Is your orientation one of a cynical as if or a longing what if? You probably know already based on how you've experienced this series on the four loves, the four, four prayers of Pack. When you hear about this dream that God has laid on the hearts of Prairie Alliance Church, that the church should represent the demographic of the town. In Portage, that being one-third First Nations. In, in Nipua, it being one-third Filipino. Do you go, as if? As if. There is so much bad blood, so much history, so many reasons why that can't, as if. Or do you long for it to happen? Not even talking really about believing it'll happen, just longing for it to happen. Just wishing it could be true. Are you as if or are you what if? When you think about an award-winning town, are you an as if person? There's like a secret part of you every time there's something on Portage Line about crime, you're like, yeah, as if this could ever be that award-winning beautiful place. As if, or you hear about this, some of these developments and government grants for things and you're like, it's just, it's just like, it, it's not gonna last. It's probably gonna create more problems than, than it's gonna solve, as if. Or are you, what if God is answering our prayers? What if he actually laid this thing on our hearts to pray for and now it's coming true? What about one touch healing? You hear a story, somebody talks about a pain they had in their body and then somebody prayed for them and it's gone. Like as if, we are so complex, there's so many psychosomatic reasons, there's so many placebos, there's so your desire to make it happen, as if. Or do you long that that might be the daily reality of people who follow Jesus, that there's that hope and that we're to long for that? And with multi-site, PAC's commitment and call to go to rural hubs and create vibrant churches, are you as if? I mean, we can hardly pay the bills here. How are we going to do that? As if. There's a reason that there's, these churches have died in these towns. As if. Or, or do you long for it? Do you, do you dream about it? Are you oriented as a cynic? Or do you long for these things to happen? 
All the good stuff, I think in a human life, happens on the longing side. Unfortunately, that's where all the disappointment is as well, yes? And I realize that as disappointments in my life have stacked up through the years, I've moved from being predominantly a what-if longing person to somebody who has to struggle with the as-if side of things. I sometimes remember if I would have the courage at my age now to ask my wife on a first date. But I didn't really know any better when I was 19. <laughs> Tamara's a little bit older than me, and you, it's not really, you know, it doesn't make much difference now, but when you're in your second year of university and you're interested in this girl who's done her diploma and is a year into her career as a radiation therapist and has a house and a car, and the last guy she dated was like a lawyer, <laughs> and you're literally living in a broom closet. <laughs> I was living with uh, Mark Wesolowski, uh, his parents, Jerry and Wanda, are still a part of PAC, and, and uh, that first month of living together, we didn't get along great, so I just moved into the closet in our one-bedroom apartment. And whatever Tamara's list was of dream men or things that she's looking for in a guy, she wasn't probably on that list. I'm looking for the guy in the broom closet, <laughs> just suffocating without the windows. It was... So I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I have no business calling her, as if she's going to be interested in a bum like me. As if, I, like, there's really nothing to offer. I'm going to take her for a ride in my Festiva. Like, it's just not, I'm, I'm struggling to know. But, but what if? What if? What if we get married someday and God blesses us with kids and we get to, uh, and like, she steers me correctly through life. And, and what if, what if, what if it's so fruitful? And what if 19 years later you get to have so many stories and memories? And like, what if? So, I took the plunge, and I, I went with a what if, and, and if it hadn't gone well, I would have just gone back to my little broom closet and, and played some NHL 95 with Mark, and, and that you know, would have been sad for a few days. Would have been disappointed. But man, what I got because I moved into the what if. And so this morning is about, as we're halfway through the Four Love series, it's about challenging you with the what ifs that you need to pursue these adventures with Jesus and you need to understand when you're cynical and how that's holding you back. You need to understand the difference between what you think is wisdom and caution and actual flat-out cynicism. As we go through Acts 19, we're going to be challenged in a few different ways from a few different angles to move from a place of as if to, oh, what if this could be true? And you can do that because I'm actually not asking you to believe anything new. I'm asking you to change your posture from a paralyzing cynicism of as if, which goes nowhere. You know what your life will be like tomorrow if you leave here going as if. It'll be exactly like it is now. But if you can pivot, and if you can introduce some longing and some freshness, you're actually not even believing anything. You're just going, what if it's true? What if it's possible? What if it's real? What if it might be next for me? What might happen if I move in that direction? Okay? A little degree of shift, but boy, it'll change the trajectory of your life. Let's start at the very beginning of the chapter that had the verse about the handkerchiefs in it. Well, Apollos was at Corinth, and we don't need to worry about that for the purposes this morning. Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. Paul hikes over the mountains, comes to the vibrant city of Ephesus, a lot of religious things going on, commercial things, military things. It's one of the happening places in the ancient world. There he found some disciples, and he asked them, do you believe, did, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So he sees some people that, that have the appearance of, of faith, they're following Jesus, but there's something off. There's something off about them, and, and it seems as if he observes them for a while, he gets to know them a little bit, and he's like, there's there's something missing here. And then he understands what it is, and he, he asks this question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Did you just, like, think with your heads about this stuff? Did you decide this was the way to go? Or, or was there an actual embracing in your heart? Was there, let's say, a longing for inner transformation? Are you, what's, what's really happened here? And they answer honestly, uh, no. We haven't even heard there's a Holy Spirit. So Christianity forming and developing, working its way through, it's not like set up like it is now where you can almost hand somebody a card and be like, here's what you believe. They're still, Paul's still formulating it really in these communities. And so these guys, they don't know. 
So Paul asks, what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, talking about John the Baptist. So John baptized people to prepare them for when Jesus comes. Paul tells them this. John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. So when John baptized you, he did not say, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He said something else. If he said anything at all, I don't know. Jesus tells us when we are to be baptized that that's how to do it. Baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So if you're baptized that way, you at least know about the Holy Spirit. These guys weren't, but they're willing. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. Often when the Holy Spirit comes on somebody, there's a, some sort of a physical manifestation. In this case, it was, it was tongues sort of sealed for them that that happened. That doesn't necessarily mean that that happens to everybody, but we certainly are open to that happening. In this first block of teaching, here's what I want you to see. I want you to take your level of cynicism and understand that if that's really high, you don't have the power of the Holy Spirit in you. You can't be filled with the Holy Spirit and cynical. You simply can't. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of opportunity, transformation, creative generation, newness, freshness, health, hope, and resurrection. That's the Spirit. And if you are like, as if, it doesn't work. You're not receptive. You're not receiving it. So if you're curious about, where am I at with the Holy Spirit? Like, am I a bit like these disciples? Maybe I grew up in a church where the Holy Spirit wasn't really emphasized or talked about, and I'm still figuring it out. Pay attention to your level of cynicism. If you're riddled with cynicism, if you're pessimistic and you're an as-if person, that's a really good indication that you need to lean into the gift of the Holy Spirit for you because you cannot be an as-if person and have the Spirit that speaks to our longings and our groanings, the what-if Spirit alive and well in you. It's a great litmus test, is your cynicism. So you need the Holy Spirit if you're going to become a what-if person. And you can understand why somebody gets cynical when they're trying to live the Christian life when they don't have the Holy Spirit helping them. Because there's not a lot of success. You're doing a lot of external things and they're not really working so good and you've got this up and down battle with temptation that just seems to cycle over and over and you start to naturally move to a place of as if. The Holy Spirit interrupts that cycle and begins to introduce longings. Let's keep going. Paul entered the synagogue. He always started there. He went to the Jews first. He knew he'd find some people that knew the first part of the story, and he would just come in with the Jesus sequel. So it's, in some ways, it's easier. These people would understand more what he's talking about than when he goes to non-Jewish people because he has to tell the whole story, not just the Jesus end part and tie it in. He goes to the synagogue, and he speaks boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. Three months. Three months in, though, some stuff starts to happen. Some of the Jews become obstinate. They refuse to believe and publicly malign the way. I like that it's called the way here. It's called Christianity. It's called the way. It's so helpful for you to know. Are, do you believe the stuff of Christianity, or are you following the way of Jesus? They understood it to be a way of life, implicating and having implications for, rather, your relationships, finances, priorities, there is a path, there is a way, the way of Jesus, and I'm on it. These were what people were doing and, and following, and some didn't like it. They maligned it. So Paul just left. <laughs> I guess three months in, he's like, you know, this is not the best place for me to be spending my time. He rents a hall, and he goes to the lecture hall of Tyrannus. That's not a place, that's a guy. He rents this guy's hall. And for two years, he gets up at dawn, and he does his tent making and, and the stuff that he did to pay the bills, and then he goes to this lecture hall he's rented, and there's a bit of a siesta time in the ancient Near East in the afternoon, and he would lecture through that, and then some people would hang around later. About six o'clock, they'd call it a day, sleep, back at it again, two years. And the word spreads. The stuff Paul's saying spreads all over the place. Jews hear it, Greeks hear it all through the province of Asia. People heard the word of the Lord, the message that Paul's sharing. Then we get to our verse that set us up this morning. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illness were cured and the evil spirits left them. 
Some of us have been disappointed as we've at one time longed for healing and then it didn't happen and we moved into the as if. I'm, I'm just calling us to be courageous. We're, in the Bible, we're supposed to just keep longing. Just keep longing. God will do things for you in your longing. May this verse just pivot you in that direction. Keep asking, keep pressing in, keep growing. Longing leads to perseverance, which leads to faith, which leads to fruit. None of those things are to make you feel bad. Maybe I'm not longing enough, maybe not persevering enough. No, that's just where the path goes. That's, that's the path of joy. Just, just pivot from the as if into the what if. It continues. It gets even a little bit stranger maybe for some of us than the handkerchiefs, which is saying a lot. Some Jews went around driving out evil spirits. They tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. So in this spiritual hub, there's temples all over the place. People are starting to pay attention that something's going on with Paul, something going on with Jesus that we've never seen before. We, this is different. Handkerchiefs healing people. And they understand that when you use the name of Jesus, when you're praying, especially when you're addressing spiritual powers, it means something. For some of us, this is mind-blowing. Because we grew up really narrowly in the West in the last 50 years, which we, means we are in the vast minority of people, even in con the contemporary world, and certainly in human history, who doubt the existence of the spiritual realm in, the, in this way. We are sheltered and biased because we just... We just grew up that way. But most people in human history, and even most people today all around the world, this, this sort of stuff about seeing the spiritual realm and, and relating to it and having its impact on us for good or evil is not a big shocker is it, that it can be for some of us. However, even in this context, when, when those, those, those narrow uh, lines of your hallway come down and you start to see some of this stuff, it can be mind-blowing when you join like the vast majority of human beings who are already understanding and, and seeing some of this stuff, you do begin to understand how powerful the name of Jesus is. He's the name above every name. And here's how it would work. And so for me, the walls have come down in the last couple of years, let's say. And so I've started to look at, at in ancient history, how did they do this, this exorcism stuff? And this is, this is a little bit of a window into it. All around this time, and in, in the book of, in, in the city of Ephesus, there was a lot of this, manuals about how to do exorcisms. You can probably find them today. You go to a bookstore and ask where the exorcism section is. You go ahead and, and do that. And, uh, and you'd probably find a manual of sorts. And, uh, and the security guard would also follow you. <laughs> so the, the general gist is you evoke the name of a more powerful spiritual figure. But the deal is, if I'm going to get rid of the little demon of, that's like say a self-injurious demon in somebody, I will have to say something like, okay, we're going to get a bigger, like pride. So pride is going to take over from this little demon that's causing this person to hurt themselves. So they won't hurt themselves anymore, but they're going to, they, they've submitted themselves to pride. So it's a, it's a deal with the devil. But if you submit yourself to the name above every name, the power that loves you and won't hurt you and longs to put the Spirit of God in you, then you have the authority to use the name of Jesus. And there's unquestionable authority when that happens. It's mind-blowing. But if you're like these jokers that are just kind of saying, oh, this is a powerful name, I have no intention of submitting to Jesus, I have no intention of, of giving him dominion in my life, I'm just going to use it like a spell, <laughs> it can go pretty bad, as you'll see. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. They're going around exorcists, probably charging money, using the name of Jesus to try and free people from oppression. And uh, so one day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but, but who are you? You see the, the name stuff going on there? You have, you have no authority, you have no name, it doesn't mean anything. When, when I first started praying like this, this was my worst fear. I'd be praying for somebody and the spirit would be like, Jesus I know, Ray Wilms I know, <laughs> but, but who are you? Uh, that reflects a misunderstanding of, of my desire to, the power in my desire to submit to Christ. Certainly not perfect, but my heart's desire is to press into the perfection for which Christ first possessed me. 
And so it is in my heart of hearts, at the core of my being, that if Jesus Christ shows me something that needs to change in my life, I'll do everything I can to do it. Probably not going to get it the first time. It might be a battle for a while, but I am his. And so I can use his name. So that'll never happen. Who are you? No, I'm his. So there's no fear there. These people not in that happy place. Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them, overpowered them all, and gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. This went bad. They lost a lot of business after that, probably. No one wants to go to the naked exorcists. <laughs> People see this stuff. Word travels. Handkerchiefs, sons of Sceva getting beaten and stripped. When this came to be known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, holy fear. Something's different here. There's a lot of different spiritual options for me to pursue in my life in this town. There's something different about this name. The Lord Jesus began to be held in high honor. And there's something interesting that happens. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. That word there, who believed, points in two different directions, and intentionally so. It means that some people saw this stuff, and they didn't actually follow the way, they didn't believe in the way, but this amazing demonstration of power was enough for them to start to believe, and they confessed and came to Jesus, let's say. So they moved from a place of not believing to believing, but then there was another category that's included here, and these were people that believed already, but they had held something in reserve. So they believed in the way, they were following the way, but they needed now to confess something they, they had done, something they had held in, in reserve. It was almost as if they said, yeah, I'll follow Jesus, but as if I'm going to give up this. I will follow Jesus, but as if I'm going to give up financial security. I'll follow Jesus, but as if I'm going to give up my fancy ways of protecting myself from having to serve too much and being tired. Yeah, I'll follow Jesus, but as if I'm going to forgive, I'm not going to call my brother. Yeah, I'll follow Jesus, but as if, and so there's something that they're holding in reserve, but when they see the power of Jesus, they realize, why on earth am I doing this? Why do I need to hedge my bets in any way with this master of the universe? It's just, it's stupid. Who else can do the things that Jesus can do? Why would I think that I need to hold something in reserve so that just in case Jesus doesn't come through, just in case if I follow his way all the way and it doesn't work, I still got some stuff to fall back on. Why would I ever do that? So they come out and they confess. And they do something which is really powerful. Hard for me to even think of what the equivalent is for us today, but it's important to see exactly what they do. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. Apparently 50,000, or pardon me, a drachma is like a day's wage. So that's, that's a lot of money. Now here's the thing. You and I say we're sorcerers. We got books. We get convicted. We say, yeah, let's burn this. I'm going to burn this. You burn your book. Now, again, burning books is a weird stigma for some of us, this is not fascist police coming into their home and taking their books and burning them. This is them voluntarily doing it. Make sure you catch that. They're doing this. We burn our books, so to speak, this afternoon. Tomorrow, I can go to Chapters and get another one. I can order one on Amazon. There actually is a way to turn back. I can, I can have this demonstration of confession and sadness and, oh, I'm so sorry, and then go back. Very hard for them to, not just that they couldn't go to a bookstore and buy this stuff, but most of this, it's the only copy. People aren't rattling off photocopies of these things. There's, it's very tough to go back after you do something like this. But they do. They see the power of Jesus, and what they were holding is as if I'm going to give up this book. It suddenly just seems so small. It just becomes so incredibly obvious in that moment to them that the little innocent thing that they thought they were holding on to is actually the thing that's keeping them in paralyzing cynicism 
and it's holding them back from the adventure of what if. What if I just burnt the book? What if I just, what if I just burnt the book? And then all I would have was him. What if I just did some definitive thing that trapped me for Jesus? I didn't build in this escape plan. I didn't build in this back. I actually just, I trapped myself for him. No turning back. The book has been burned. I've been praying that the Spirit of God would show you what that is for you. What would it mean for you to come clean? Your life will be a, a series of coming clean, but hopefully not about the same thing all the time. You'll realize, oh, as if, as if I should be so worried about this money thing. I'm going to burn a bridge. I'm just going to fill out the direct deposit form in a way that stretches me and trap myself for Jesus. That's what I'm going to do. Boom, done. Pretty close to building a bridge. Burning a bridge. But then that's done. And pretty soon there's something else that comes along and you're like, oh, as if I need to be this selfish with my schedule. As if my home needs to be my castle. As if... And then there's that tension. And then you lay that down. And then a little bit later, there's another as if. And that's what's called discipleship is you grow and ascend from glory to glory to glory, becoming like him, moving forward in perfection. But if you're still stuck on that first as if, that's a tough place to be. So jar yourself out of it, whatever it might be. As if I could ever confess to my house church or even just like, the right people in my house church, how serious the pornography addiction is, as, as if. I can just take care of that quietly and on the side and it's really not that big a deal. As if I'm going to talk about that. As if I'm going to call my brother and ask for forgiveness. As if I'm going to sign up and, and care about this. As if I'm going to give my heart to the four loves. As if. So whatever it is for you, and I'll invite the band up at this stage, um, God will make it clear. He delights to make it clear. And he also delights to show you enough of who he is so that the choice becomes obvious enough for you to understand that burning the books is your best option. And he can do that too. I do think this is the morning when books you've held on to for a long time and they've been buried in the closet or they've been tucked under the bed or whatever that book is, I think for a lot of you, this is the morning where you just move on that. You just stick a fork in it, you kill it, you put it to rest, you tell somebody about it, and you don't ever have to think about it again. It's a beautiful place to be. It's his invitation to you as we sing. May he show you what book you need to burn. Let's stand.